Good afternoon. Welcome to the final webinar of the Cooking for Success series, Recipes for Growing Food-Based Businesses. This webinar series is a partnership between the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders, NALCAB, and the California Association for Microenterprise Opportunity, CAMEO, and has been made possible with the support from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. This webinar is being recorded, and we will distribute the recording to everyone who has registered. Also, attendees have been muted, but we encourage you to ask questions. Please type your questions into the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. We will monitor them and answer them throughout the webinar as possible. And we will have additional time at the end for Q&A. Leading the webinar today, we have myself, Storm Taliaferro from NALCAP and Heidi, um, I'm sorry, and Emily from Cameo. Emily, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for everyone for joining us. As many of you know, food entrepreneurship plays a vital role in creating economic mobility for Latino and other immigrant families and communities as a whole. I think it's safe to say that you're all attending this webinar because you care about the success of entrepreneurs in your communities. Um, Cameo does as well. Um, we are the California Network of Entrepreneurial Training Programs and Microlenders and business service providers that basically help small businesses to start and grow. We see that approaches to entrepreneurial support are often presented into um, what are basically narrow silos, training entrepreneurs or access to capital. Uh, but we work to shift the focus to a more holistic view. Uh, some call the approach place-based um, economics, we call it the local entrepreneurship ecosystem, and it's made up of essentially five C's. Um, those C's are coaching, capital, connections, climate, and culture, as you can see on this slide. Um, basically, capital refers to the financial resources that a business owner needs to be successful. The, um, the C for coaching is the entrepreneur's training that they receive to be able to run their businesses. And the third C connection is resources and relationships to the overall network that um, we as our service providers provide to those small business owners. And then the last two C's, culture and, and climate, um, are very external. Culture refers to the community's perception and support of small businesses and entrepreneurial endeavors. And climate really refers to what we'll be talking about today, the regulation and economic development and policy. Um, with all of these five C's um, in place, small businesses can succeed, create jobs, financial wealth and wealth for families and local community success. This webinar series is about the local entrepreneurial ecosystem as it refers to food industry. Um, we've decided to narrow it down into three distinct parts that all work together. Last week, la um, in the beginning, the first one we mentioned coaching, and then after that, capital, and today we're looking at climate and policy. We really hope this series is food for thought on how to support emerging entrepreneurs and transform the entrepreneurial environment for Latino and immigrant families who are engaged in neighborhood-based small business activity. The ultimate goal is to ensure that our food entrepreneurs are successful and these communities are sustainable. With that in mind, we'll move to our agenda. Thank you, Emily. So first we'll kick off with a quick audience poll to see who's in the room, so to speak. Then our expert guest speakers from Cook Alliance and Inclusive Action for the City will talk about what they're seeing on the ground in terms of policy and advocacy followed by uh, questions and answer session and discussion. And finally, we'll close out by sharing some additional resources for those who want to dive in more deeply into policy and advocacy work in their communities to support food-based entrepreneurs. And even though there'll be a longer Q&A period in the latter half of this webinar, please feel free to type in your questions as we go. 
um, type them into the chat field on WebEx and we'll pose those questions to our speakers wherever uh, most relevant. We're trying to make this more of a conversation style webinar. Finally, we'll conclude um, by sharing additional resources at the end. So first I want to quickly introduce NALCAB. NALCAB strengthens the economy by advancing economic mobility in Latino communities. We are the hub of a national network of more than 120 organizations in 40 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico that are anchor institutions in geographically and ethnically diverse Latino communities. And Cameo is a statewide network of entrepreneurial training programs and micro lenders with the mission to grow a thriving ecosystem of support for underserved entrepreneurs. So now we'd like to hear more about who is attending this webinar. Uh, many of our members have experience helping food entrepreneurs to launch and grow their businesses. So we'd like to know, how are you supporting entrepreneurs? So if you could just type into the text field, um, whether you do coaching and technical assistance, group training, if you provide capital in the forms of loans or equity or grant assistance, uh, if you provide some sort of real estate asset, like an incubator or a rental space, um, if you do financial capability work, um, or if you do policy advocacy work. Um, also, finally, if you're a food entrepreneur or other, um, if you uh, just type in to let us know um, how it is that you work with food entrepreneurs. see uh, coming in here, it looks like we have some technical assistance providers, um, some people who are providing capital, um, some lenders as well. So uh, it does look like we have uh, a, a variety of, of uh, different types of organizations on the line. So that's great to know. Okay, the next question we'd like to ask is, uh, what is your organization's experience in policy and advocacy? Um, are you not currently engaged? Um, is your organization thinking of engaging and forming a policy plan? Um, or have you been active uh, in policy uh, and advocacy for the last couple of years? Um, please take a moment and type into the, the chat box to let us know how active um, you are currently in policy and advocacy. Um, so we have a couple different responses coming in. Um, our organization is highly involved, um, but the person on the line is not personally involved. Um, a few other responses that say um, organizations are thinking about engaging. Um, several uh, who are active in policy for uh, less than three years, not involved at all, a few three to five years. So again, um, sounds like we have a, a pretty broad range, which is great. Um, we really hope that uh, we'll be able to answer questions from organizations that are um, either that are across the spectrum, whether they've been engaged in this for years. Um, uh, and we have, here we have another response: we've been engaged in policy, but haven't focused specifically on food entrepreneurs. So again, that's. Um, we're excited you're here. So thanks for joining us. Yes, and so hopefully there's something for everyone uh, in this webinar. Our experts really have a lot of information to share. Um, so our topic today is ensuring a fertile regulatory environment for food business. And when it comes to food-based businesses, policy, laws, and regulations play a big role. Local policies on everything from community investments, zoning and land use, licensing and permitting and more create the climate that can either support or hinder small business economic growth. Joining us today, we have Liz Allen from Cook Alliance and Lyric Kelkar from Inclusive Action. Both have led statewide and local campaigns to support food entrepreneurs. So we'll get started now with our speakers. And first we'll hear from Liz Allen from Cook Alliance. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right, great. My name is Liz Allen. Um, I am the policy director for the Cook Alliance. Cook stands for Creating Opportunities and Opening Kitchens. And we are the nonprofit that legalized the country's first home restaurants. 
So we essentially um, wrote and passed two different laws in the state of California that allow, allow people to permit their home kitchen and sell food out of it. So um, our mission is really to establish a just and people powered home cooking industry. So while we know legalization and policy is the first step, we also know that labor organizing and ensuring that the folks who are actually producing the food and doing the labor, um, protecting their um, their rights and protecting the ability for them to, you know, make a, a real um, a living wage is part of our work as well. So uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so just to some background on the Cook Alliance. We were founded in 2018 after um, a two year run of a bill um, of, of bills in the state um, legislature to try to legalize home cooking. Our first bill was in 2016, which failed miserably. Um, our second bill was run in 2017 and, and um, failed, failed uh, in the committee of origin. And we put together, we decided to spin out a nonprofit and put together a coalition to try to rally around the bill in 2018. Uh, to see if we could get it passed. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we um, organized a pet petition that had 80,000 signatures on it. We built a coalition over over, over 100 orgs um, to support this uh, bill, which was called AB 626. And these organizations were wide ranging everything from uh, refugee groups and immig immigrant group, immigrant rights groups to small business association to uh, a few restaurants and folks who had, you know, come up from their own home kitchen um, to, you know, uh, just folks who were really uh, much more interested in rural development. Uh, so we had a very wide range um, of groups and from all over the state. And that was ended up being particularly important when you're working on trying to uh, move state, uh, state policy, but having a, a large number of folks from across a large swath of districts so that every person you talk to in the state legislature can at least see somebody from their own district. Um, in uh, 2018, we passed uh, AB 626, which technically legalized home cooking. Uh, however, we had some serious problems with um, with our with food safety element of it. So I'm aware, um, and I've been working on food policy for two years, but I am not a public health expert, um, and so. Um, halfway through 2018 session, the Department of Environmental Health, the folks who do the regulating of, of, of kitchens, dropped their support for our bill. And when they dropped their support for their, our bill, they also dropped their technical assistance for the bill. So AB 626 passed, but had quite a few problems with it. So we ended up having to run a second bill, a cleanup bill the next year called AB 377. And and that bill was written almost 100% by the Department of Environmental Health to try to fix some of the problems that were in the original bill. I don't recommend this path as a as a smart as a as a path that I would that I would take, but it's the one we ended up um, going on. Um, and uh, and this was, you know, between the two bills, we cleaned up enough of the language in AB 626, including some jurisdictional issues, and this allowed counties to then opt in to allow um, home cooks to permit their home kitchen home kitchens and sell food. So um, in California, if you live, for example, in Riverside County, you can file for a permit and then you can go ahead and sell 30 meals per day or 60 meals per week. Uh, there's a revenue cap of $50,000 with a COLA, so a cost of living increase. Uh, and this allows people to both incubate a food business and allows them to have a legal pathway to be able to be um, above ground, which of course opens up um, ability for them to raise capital if they need it, allows them to incubate a small uh, food idea and then, you know, either either keep it small, so use it as a side hustle or Christmas money, et cetera, or allows them to then branch out and branch up. So uh, this is really exciting work, but, um, and, and, and so today what we're doing is we're actually helping all these different counties adopt and implement um, this bill. So we essentially have 60 different um, volunteers around the state that are the leads for their own county. Um, and we are working at the county level with county supervisors and county Department of Environmental Health to get this um, bill up and uh, implemented and up and running in the 58 different counties in the four cities that have their own Department of Environmental Health. Um, and so it has been 
uh, you know, essentially four years since we first started. And we've gotten uh, the best thing that's happened in the last four years is we've gotten really tight on our messaging. And we've really helped, we've really built a large coalition, both of, of volunteers who are really supportive of our work and organizations that are supportive of our work and partner organizations that can help us with rollout. And, and of course, passing a bill is only, you know, a tiny, a tiny piece of the actual work, the implementation and the fidelity of, of the actual bill is um, just as important, is, is more important in my opinion, than the passage of policy. Policy is, you know, fairly shiny, um, but if it's not implemented well, if, for example, in this bill, if it's not implemented well, then we're not, we're not serving the people we intended to serve. It could very easily become a hobbyist bill for those folks who are, you know, wealthy or stay at home, um, you know, stay at home parents who are, are looking for uh, for a hobby rather than uh, the target demographic, which for us is folks is is low income folks of color, you know, single single parents who are struggling, retirees, disabled folks, uh, really trying to open a pathway for people to enter the food industry um, and um, essentially start their own business for under a thousand dollars. So you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so um, another thing that I wanted to mention in this is that, and which I've like talked about a little bit, is that um, we have been working really hard to collaborate with uh, with our other with partner organizations, and using a bunch of what I would consider kind of soft skills as we do this food work, which you know is things like code switching, depending on whether you're talking to a Republican senator about you know small business starts or a Democratic senator about protecting newcomers and immigrants. Um, and um, using a lot of yes and. So, you know, there are folks who are interested in this work from a variety of different angles, which is exciting, but allows us and allows us to say a lot of yes. Like, yes, we believe in, you know, farm to table and fully regenerative, you know, food sources. And we believe that, um, you know, people should be able to get their food sources from wherever they want. You know, yes, we believe that, um, you know, folks should uh, should be able to incubate a business if we want if they want to, and we believe that if folks just want to cook for three weeks a year and they want to do tamales around Christmas, that they should be allowed to do that. So doing a lot of yes and with our with our uh, constituents and with lawmakers was a um, was a key uh, strategy that we used. And you know, one of the last things we did is we have a, a pretty wide brand, um, so that everyone can find meaning in it. So essentially allowing people to, um, to, to see and read the thing that's most important into, what, into the work that we're doing. Um, and this has been, that was really particularly important at the state level when we had um, some folks who, you know, really didn't care about the social justice angle that like we did, um, but were much more concerned about, uh, you know, the rural food deserts, for example. Um, and and being able to keep wide enough to be able to incorporate all of those uh, values um, was was pretty key. And of course, you know, all of this, all of this happened with a lot of compromise. So, what, um, you know, a lot of the things that I was talking about before, the specifics within the bill, for example, thirty meals per day or sixty per week or the revenue cap, those were all compromises for us. Things that we would have liked to see raised, we would have liked to see the revenue cap be te pegged to a minimum wage or sorry, to a livable wage, not a minimum wage. Um, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, designing, creating and passing legislation is just compromise and trying to take a step back and be like, okay, this is, you know, does 30 meals a day or 60 meals a week, is that gonna help people? And if it's gonna help people, then, you know, the answer is yes. Now, if it's gonna kill the bill, so for example, we really had to get into the weeds on, um, on like a lot of food safety stuff. So I learned a lot about grease traps and ventilation hoods and, uh, you know, uh, very specific backsplash requirements. And, you know, if someone was required to get, for example, a commercial ventilation hood and do and retrofit a kitchen, that would effectively kill the bill and kill the opportunity. So things that um, would essentially de facto, de facto, you know, um, kill the, the opportunity for the folks that we wanted the opportunity, we fought tooth and nail. And then some of the other things that, you know, maybe weren't ideal, but would certainly help people, we compromised on. So, um, 
that that is where we are now where we've got uh, one county that's opted in and has issued i think 27 different permits so we've got home cooks cooking in riverside we have five other counties that have opted in and are um, are in the process of setting up permitting since we were the first state to do this uh, it's been pretty complicated to help uh, get department of environmental health on board and stand up these totally new programs um, so we're doing a lot of technical assistance uh, as we implement the bill uh, go ahead to the next slide. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, I guess I already touched on this one. This is about our network of 60 volunteers that are, um, are actually implementing our ground game. So they are folks who want to cook or are invested in, uh, you know, in other, for other reasons. We have actually a lot of parents who want to be able to buy food from their neighbors who are also involved in helping advocate for this. Um, and those folks are showing up at county meetings, getting, you know, testifying in front of the board, uh, getting, um, you know, writing letters, hosting uh, dinners, and, you know, of course, we've put together uh, technical assistance packets so that counties can, so to help counties opt in. Um, but really, it's not, uh, there's only three of us that are involved here at the Cook Alliance. Um, we're a small team, but we have a large team of volunteers. Um, and that works best both for the folks on the ground knowing, uh, knowing and having a sense of what's best for their community and how best to position this bill that will be effective for their own county. Um, and then just, you know, a matter of, of resources, resource allocation for us. So we support this, this wide network of, of volunteers. Go ahead to the next. Um, great. Uh, and so if you want to hear more about our work, you can go to cookalliance.org. We also have a bunch of resources. So if you have folks who want to take advantage of this opportunity in Riverside or want to keep abreast of um, how to, you know, um, how cooks can apply for permits, we have FAQs both in English and Spanish. You can go to cookalliance.org slash resources. Um, and if you want to learn more about our values and mission, you can go to cookalliance.org slash manifesto. Um, and if you've got any questions about our work, want to help bring this to your, to our county or partner with us, we'd love to hear from you. You can email me at Liz at cookalliance.org. Um, and we would love to talk to you. Uh, thanks so much. Um, thank you, Liz. Uh, now we're going to turn it over to Lyric Kalker from inclusive action for the city. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Lyric from Inclusive Action for the City. First, I'd like to say thank you to NALCAB and Cameo for, for having us on this, and I think this is a really important conversation. So uh, at Inclusive Action for the City, our mission is to create inclusive economies in low-income urban communities and uplift people who lack access to capital. Uh, we're a community and economic development organization, and we focus most of our work in Los Angeles and the LA region, both the city, county, and then Southern California a little bit more broadly. Uh, we've been operating for about 11 years, and uh, it actually started with the LA Street Vendor Campaign. So the way that we're structured is we kind of have two basic camps. We have the policy and advocacy camp, and then we also have our economic development strategies. Within policy and advocacy, uh, our major initiatives include the LA Street Vendor Campaign, whose mission was to legalize street vending within Los Angeles, our Adopt-A-Lot Campaign, which is a vacant lot reuse program uh, that has now been adopted by the city, and our largest convening of the year is the Planning and Land Use Strategy Summit. Uh, that's a summit that we hold every year to talk about issues that are affecting people in Los Angeles, but then also bringing innovative ideas from around the country. Um, from the LA Street Vendor Campaign, we developed a set of economic development strategies because we were finding that the vendors didn't have access to capital. And that's really where the roots of our SEMIA fund come in. And um, the SEMIA fund is a micro loan program where we give very small loans from about $1,000 to $5,000 to micro entrepreneurs. Many of them are street vendors, and at this point, we've expanded our portfolio, and we've uh, lent out almost $500,000 to 48 different businesses in the LA region. Um, our Restore Fund is a micro equity program where we provide capital and equity for small businesses, and we have two clients right now. One is a hot sauce company, and another is a cupcake company. Um, our next economic development strategy is Compra Foods, which is a healthy food distribution network that where we provide 
uh, purchasing cooperative administrative pieces um, and distribute healthy produce throughout South LA and East LA and other areas that are considered food deserts, uh, providing access to healthy food in these neighborhoods. And two of our newest initiatives are the Community Owned Real Estate and Micro Business Accelerator. So the Community Owned Real Estate is um, a, a coalition of groups, ourselves, East LA Community Corporation and Little Tokyo Service Center who have uh, come together and bought a handful of different buildings in the east side of Los Angeles as anti-displacement strategy. So they're all commercial buildings and we're going to ultimately be uh, providing technical assistance to have these different small businesses be part owner in this system. Um, and then last is our micro business accelerator, which is, is kind of that, that technical assistance piece in order uh, to provide assistance to small businesses to become brick and mortar owners of the space that they they do work in. For today, though, I'm going to be focusing on the LA Street Vendor campaign. Um, so on the next slide, we I talk a little bit about the local level. So the LA Street Vendor campaign, as I mentioned, our mission was to legalize street vending within the city of Los Angeles. Um, after 10 years of advocacy, we did it. It's really incredible. Uh, in 2018, it was legalized at the city level. and um, that was done as a part of a coalition. So Inclusive Action is one of the founding members. And then another group is the East LA Community Corporation, who we also partner with for four. Um, Public Council, who is a lawyering group. And then the LA Food Policy Council. This was all done in conjunction and with vendors at the forefront of the entire policy. So we, um, we really like to ensure that any of the policy that we work on uh, uplifts the voices of the people we're advocating for. And part of that work is not only having vendors and vendor leaders at each and every one of our meetings, but making sure that they're at the city council, um, at any of the council office meetings that we have. Uh, and that's really been, um, or our, our cross-disciplinary team rather has been really strategic in making sure that this was a successful campaign. And I know Liz had mentioned that it it's uh, your, your advocacy changes once it legalizes. So now that it's been legalized, our advocacy has changed a lot because we, we did have to give up some key components of legalizing street vending. And now that we're in the implementation phase, uh, advocacy looks a lot like making sure that the needs of the vendors are at the forefront of implementation. Um, and I could certainly talk more about that a little bit later. So the LA Street Vendor campaign, when it was legalized in 2018, we it actually had a, a fire lit under it because the state came in and we, we helped with the, the state level um, in creating what is called SB 946, which is the Safe Sidewalk Vending Act. Uh, it was introduced by Senator Ricardo Lara uh, in February of 2018. And uh, some of the folks from the Street Vending campaign helped third part of that bill. In September of 2017 or of 2018, um, Governor Brown signed the law and decriminalized sidewalk vending across the state. That's really what made sure that the city council at uh, LA level legalized street vending because one of the really huge things that it did was say that you're not allowed to enforce street vending violations without having a program. And so if they didn't pass a program, they wouldn't be able to regulate street vending. Um, and across the state also, it decriminalized it and then also expunged past violations, which was really useful because this is really an immigrant rights issue. And we wanted to make sure that uh, immigrants were being protected by this because many are undocumented. And we did find a couple of cases where um, some folks were looking at deportation because of the violations for street vending. And we didn't think that folks who are who are really just trying to make an honest living and um, provide for their families should be punished for that. So out of this campaign came the California Street Vendor Campaign. So now we have partners across the state who helped get this passed. Um, and it's really produced uh, a, a great network of organizations throughout California who are uplifting the work of entrepreneurs and micro entrepreneurs across the state. Um, that's really all I have for you in terms of the LA Street Vendor campaign. I, I appreciate your time and I, I'd be happy to answer questions either later on this call or please feel free to email me and my, my email is lyric at inclusiveaction.org. Great. 
Well, thank you so much, Lyric and Liz. Um, I thought perhaps we'd start off. So we're going to uh, take kick off our question and answer session now. So please take a moment and um, type in your, your questions and uh, we will get them answered for you by our experts. Um, perhaps you guys can touch upon um, what are some of the obstacles um, that you uh, often need to overcome in getting legislation passed? Um, sure, I'll, I'll talk about that. We, um, the biggest problem, well, we had two big problems, I would say. One of them, it was a totally new idea. So we often had to teach people about the problem before we could offer legalization as a solution. So it'd be like, did you know that the, you know, buying tamales, uh, you know, from someone who's made it at home is illegal? You know, did you know that uh, bake sale, bring it, you know, making stuff for a bake sale, school bake sale at your house and then selling it is illegal? We think it should be legal and here's, you know, all the reasons that we think so. But there was like this huge education piece in the beginning that was like pretty difficult to overcome where it was like, let me try to tell you about the problem. Let me try to sell this um, at a very high level before getting into the weeds of like what was actually like nitty gritty in the bill. So that was one thing. Um, uh, two was that uh, Department of Environmental Health, which are the folks that inspect, are pretty conservative. So we had a lot of problems with people just simply thinking that this could not never be done safely, even though, of course, everyone's cooking all the time and this already happens all the time across the state. You know, the idea is not new, just legalizing it is new for this country because we've come so far away from, we've come so far into an industrialized food system. People forget that actually people cook very successfully out of their houses. And there's very few foodborne illness uh, cases out of home cooked meals. Um, but trying to convince people whose you know job it is to regulate foodborne illness and try to you know stamp it out across the state uh, proved to be quite a bit of a challenge. So it required us to really get dive into you know what sort of diseases are they worried about? What are the biggest problems? You know, if it's time and temperature control, how can we? adjust the bill to get at their deepest fears and assuage those fears. And a lot of that was just trying to get a little bit more technical ourselves. And then some of it was just simply trying to um, make the case to the to the uh, senators and assembly assembly people that, you know, assembly members that this was valuable. And of course we couldn't get risk, we couldn't get risk down to zero, uh, but we've done the best job we can to reduce risk and that the value of allowing people to start a home business for under a thousand dollars outweighs the small risk that th that was there. So that was two, and then I would say three is we ran into quite a bit of classism and racism um, just in talking about this, and some of it is you know some of it was like much more obvious than we thought that you know someone said to us in at one meeting that like you know but what about people who are poor es essentially a insinuating that poor people are dirty and don't know how to, wouldn't know how to keep a kitchen clean, which is, um, you know, very offensive. And also just like a little bit shocking that, that we had to go back to kind of brass taxes around classism and racism uh, around this. But there was quite a bit of that um, as we've like been fighting, fighting these ground wars, both at the county level and at the state level. Um, and so those are kind of the three things that we've had to overcome is, you know, just biases, biases, environmental health being very conservative, and then just trying to teach a new idea. Uh, and something I'll, I'll add to Liz, for the street vendor campaign, very similarly, nobody knew that street vending was illegal in Los Angeles. Um, LA is often synonymous with street vending. And so to find that LA was the only major city in the US that doesn't have street vending legal was kind of shocking and there's definitely an educational push. Um, and what we came across at the city is that there's this perceived competition between street vendors and brick and mortar businesses, even though the customer bases are different. So typically street vendors will actually increase foot traffic to brick and mortar businesses, but um, the bids who are very strong in Los Angeles uh, definitely provided um, they they were not supportive of this initiative and it was hard to kind of find common ground with them because it was important that we create a common ground and ensure that this this would work for everybody because um, we have some really vibrant 
walking neighborhoods in Los Angeles and uh, ensuring that everybody was creating a viable entrepreneurial uh, system was, was important, both to the vendors, the brick and mortar businesses, as well as the city council members. Um, and then also we, there was like a reframing that happened for sidewalk vending at the state level, because not only of course, should it be decriminalized for these micro entrepreneurs, but it was a protection for immigrants. And um, it is a direct response to uh, our president having been elected because we wanted to protect a lot of the immigrant community here in California because it's such a heavy immigrant population. Um, and I'd say also a classism and racism type issue where a lot of it would be like, oh, well, vendors don't pay taxes and um, they don't abide by rules, whatever that means. And that's just patently false. Uh, also to say that all restaurants pay all of their taxes and all businesses pay all of their taxes is it's a it's very strange that this type of narrative was being put for these street vendors when um, it was not being applied to any of the other entrepreneurs or businesses that that were in the same space. We have uh, in combating classism, classism and racism. How did you do that? Were there data sources that you showed or how did you build that case or sort of help open people's eyes that, that was happening? I would say we did two things. One is we had cooks with us uh, frequently. So meeting someone who was able to talk about their food and their excitement for it and, um, you know, be a real human in the room rather than just an idea was, uh, is obviously like one of the best ways to combat bias of any sort. Uh, we also had a CDC uh, centers of disease control study that said that um, essentially foodborne illness outbreaks between happen less frequently in homes and restaurants. So we cited that study quite a bit. Um, and then we cited, you know, that one, there's another study that showed that um, time and temperature controls on food is like the, one of the number one uh, um, uh reasons that foodborne illness occurs and so um mikos don't have like essentially essentially sense it's like um a micro enterprise home kitchen um is doing takeout or dine in and there isn't much time or temperature lack in between cooking and when the food's being served that that concern was um not going to be an issue within mikos so i you know and some of it um i would say generally in, in politics we did less calling out and a lot of just kind of calling in and trying to re-educate and reorient. Um, but, you know, by trying to get people to, to talk more in facts. So, you know, like, what did you mean by that? Can you tell me more? Or, you know, using the kind of old standard of like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand what you're saying. Can you, can you describe it better? Um, is, is kind of a good fallback if, if you're stumped on that stuff, but, you know, if someone says something and be like, you know, especially if someone's like, oh, you know, but what about poverty? And you're like, well, what do you mean? You know, just playing kind of dumb to try to get someone to understand that they're what they're really invoking as a bias uh, can be helpful and a tactful way of doing it. Interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions that have uh, come in, entered online here. Um, what does technical assistance from Cook Alliance cost and who pays for it? Uh, good question. So technical assistance from Cook Alliance is free um, right now. Um, and there's three of us who work at the Cook Alliance, nobody full time. Two of us haven't been paid since October. So we are mostly volunteer organization. Um, we get some money from the SBA, from the Small Business Associations to do technical assistance. So we had a bigger contract from Northern California SBA um, last year. And this year we're working with Solano. Uh, we're in the process of um, working with smaller SBAs and with you know, particular counties that are about to pass uh, this law to help and do, um, do technical assistance within that county um, for, that, um, for that small business association. We also get some money from um, there are some tech companies that are like interested in uh, the passage of this, including like Airbnb, um, who want to be able to offer cooking classes. And they've been 
helping pay for some technical assistance that we've been able to give out uh, for free to either other states or to um, you know county folks here. So that's like. And some of our, and, you know, right now we're in the process of hiring an executive director and writing grants um, and uh, to try to get money from a, a much more diversified set of uh, funders. But if you're interested in technical assistance and are curious in partnering, I'd be happy to, to chat with you about that um, as we, uh, as we move into spring and hopefully get a, a bit more, a bit more money and can be beef up our team. We're uh, ho hopeful that we can offer real uh, webinars, both for cooks, and then we have a train the trainer webinar that we do. So if so, we can explain the law and the nuances it, of it to different um, different partner organizations so that you can then go and reach out to your constituents and train them up on the law. Great. And can you just clarify um, uh, what you mean when you say SBA, are you talking about the, the federal government's small business administration? That was another question that came in. Oh, no, sorry, uh, small business associations. So the SBDCs, uh, small business development centers um, and the small business association here in California. So that would be, um, for example, we were contracted with the uh, Northern California SBDC uh, last year. And this year we're looking at um, some of the SB, smaller local SBAs. Uh, but that's not federal money. That's uh, local California money. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. Another question that come in come has come in is, what is the cost to a county of participating in the home cooking initiative? Great question. So this bill had to be cost recovery. So whatever it costs a county to go to send an inspector to the cook's home to then. Um, to then do the inspection and issue the permit is what the permit costs. So it varies widely depending on how much it costs per hour of that inspector's time. So if you're in a rural county with cheaper inspector overhead, the permit cost is cheaper. If you're in an expensive county like San Francisco, for example, where they have to pay their inspectors a lot more money, the cost of the permit is more. However, the cost to the county on rolling it out um, or the cost to the, to the county for uh, actually running the program should be net net zero because the cost of the permit, it's a cost recovery program. However, some counties are, um, for example, San Mateo really wants to do extra training and outreach and when they're standing up the program to begin with. So some counties are putting price tags between 50 and $200,000 on program startup, not program running. That wouldn't be a continuous cost. That would just be um, an initial cost. So Riverside County, for example, I think had, I don't know if they had any initial cost. Um, or maybe they had 20K initial cost. San Mateo is looking at 200,000, but that's because they wanna train all their inspectors and they wanna do outreach. Oakland is looking at offsetting cost of the permit for some folks. So that might be a more expensive outlay for Oakland. Um, we've got Solano is looking at, I think 80,000 to stand up the program. So it kind of depends what county you're in, how much it's costing, but what we've seen is somewhere between zero and 200,000, depending on what the county wants to do. Okay, great. Thank you for, for that. Um, I wanna backtrack a little bit um, and talk about who, who needs to be at the table to achieve policy change. Um, I know Lyric, you spoke about the importance of having um, the, the vendors at meetings um, and of course, you know, working in collaboration with other organizations. I'm hoping you can uh, detail a little bit, you know, who are the stakeholders and, and who has to be at the table? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I had mentioned and you reiterated, the vendors and the needs of the vendors definitely have to be at the table. Uh, and then it would be ally organizations and people who can translate some of those needs into like legalese essentially. So policy experts are definitely helpful, specifically policy experts within the field that you're looking for for us. Of course, it's street vending. And so that was ourselves. Um, Organizers are really helpful or people who represented the groups of folks who who you're trying to build policy around. So we, that was East LA Community Corporation. Public Council is a public interest law firm. And so they were really helpful. 
And then LA Food Policy Council was also instrumental because food vending specifically was a very hard push for a number of different reasons. But aside from that, you also need allies in both within the juris or within the jurisdictions that you're trying to advocate in. So for us, we had a city council champion. We had very close contact with that city council office um, regularly, and we still do. And um, that's instrumental to this. And then, of course, building relationships with the other people who have to be voting on these different policies. At the state level, we had um, now insurance commissioner Lara, who was incredibly instrumental, as well as his staff, who uh, helped move this conversation along and um, ensure that we were doing the things that we needed to be doing and um, help provide the data that was necessary to get some of the information out. Uh, yeah, so I think it, it really involves a, a cross-sector alliance, both the, the policy, like the public policy side, and then of course the nonprofits and ally organizations being able to uplift that into what a policy might look like. Excellent. Um, yes, we have a question here. So you mentioned that uh, you had spent two year, 10 years of advocacy um, uh, working towards legalizing street vending. And Liz, you talked about having a failure and then a second failure and then having to go back and do cleanup language. Obviously, this is these are long term efforts. How do you, how does an organization who is either leading a coalition or a part of a coalition help maintain momentum uh, and sort of maintain focus and direction? Do, do you have any thoughts or tips around what seems like a pretty difficult task? Um, I Something that we definitely employed was media. So that that's really helpful in terms of both social media and then uh, like media outlets such as news. Like for here we have LAist and KPCC and a handful of different news outlets that help move this forward. Um, through the advocacy, you certainly make connections with these folks and street vending is a particularly polarizing topic for a lot of people. And um, there were moments where it certainly looked grim, <laughs> uh, but I think because it is so deeply ingrained in LA, like part of the LA culture, it uh, helped move it forward. And then tying it to real people and real faces was really important. I know Liz had mentioned that before too, to combat classism and racism. That's another way to like move things forward is like, these are real people job and their livelihood, how do we make sure that they're included in these new policies was really key to keep it moving. Yeah, I would, um, I would agree with all that. Uh, I think, yeah, press helps. We had a PBS um, documentary made about us that, um, well, about uh, not us, but the movement um, generally and home cooking generally. And that was really helpful because like getting individual case studies and stories out uh, can help galvanize people. I think um, I think it can be really uh, it, it can be really hard. Uh, you know, if you at, make too many asks of people, like, hey, call your your senator, call your representative, blah blah blah. Like our open rate did go down over the four years of doing this, um, and the number of calls we were able to drive did go down. Um, so I think that there is just kind of a reality to that. So making sure you're pacing your asks making sure people feel connected, you know, changing the ask. So it's show up to a rally one time, then it's call, then it's email, you know, then it's like, come, here's a meetup, come eat dinner with neighbors. Um, you know, that can, that can help both getting people in real life together can also help drive momentum, bringing in new partner organizations and new allies can help, you know, infuse some lifeblood into it. Um, but I do think it is, it is tricky because these campaigns take a long time and a lot of people want change faster than the legislative process will allow. Okay, great. We have another question. Um, for Cook Alliance, do you do advocacy in San Diego County? And when do you think MECA will be fully approved in San Diego? Ooh, uh, gosh, I wish I had good news about San Diego, but I don't. We have some really great advocates down there. Um, there's a, some of our most 
effective and successful organizers are in San Diego, but we also happen to have, San Diego happens to have the most conservative Department of Environmental Health in the entire state, maybe, <laughs> um, or one of them. And so while there has been a lot of advocacy, there has not been a lot of movement in San Diego thus far. Santa Barbara just opted in. LA has been looking at it, um, but that's going to move pretty slowly because LA is so big. Um, and unfortunately, San Diego is just not moving fast. But if you'd like to get involved, and we would always need more people, and we can connect you with the organizers who have a coalition down on the ground in, in San Diego, and we can give you the names of your supervisors to call. Um, that would be super helpful. And you can email me at Liz at Cook Alliance and I will send you, put you in contact with them and send you the, your supervisor names and phone numbers. And if you call them, that is a great way to help us uh, bring Mikos to San Diego. Great. Um, all right, so we've talked about the importance of, of having partners and um, bringing these, these vendors and cooks to meetings using um, data from policy experts. Um, what, are, what are some of the other soft strategies you've had to use to win hearts and minds um, in these sort of you know, policy battles? Um, for the street vendor campaign, there's been a handful of different strategies employed, but one of the uh, I think really key things is we did, we do have like actions, like whether they be in a park or on the street or something for us, street vending is a public space issue and who has access to that public space. And so, uh, using that to tell the story is really useful, especially from the policy side, because space is held by different jurisdictions. So showing that this is like a cross sectoral issue, this affects many people, both park goers and people uh, on sidewalks and brick and mortar businesses. Um, that's been a really big way to make this happen. And um, I think it was in 2017, we had a civil action right in front of City Hall. And it was led by vendors, specifically led by women, because 80% of vendors in LA are women and women of color. Most of them are immigrants. And um, I think that was really, that's a huge way to do it too, is to show that like this, this crosses boundaries aside from whether or not they're able to sell food and showing that this is a, a, a multifaceted uh, thing that needs to happen in order to create an equitable Los Angeles. Yeah, I think I mentioned um, some before, but I would say patience is like a soft skill that really helps in these campaigns. Um, as you can hear from both of our long, long uh, campaign years, um, collaboration and trying to be creative with your collaboration. You know, can you get a mayor of a city to sign a support letter? Can you, you know, get the head of the uh, small business development center to sign a letter? Can you find Kiva and get them to sign a letter? You know, can, how how broad can you um, can you get your coalition? I think is an important soft skill. And then I mentioned before, but I'll just run through them again. I think code switching is important. Uh, being able to say yes and to folks and keep the brand wide. Um, and the coalition wide, um, all those are are super important. And then, you know, super flexibility. So, you know, being able to look at something that you would much rather not do. So for example, if for us, it was opt-in rather than making this a full state bill, we had to go down to opt-in. And um, I can tell you, we didn't wanna do that at all, um, but we, we wanted to get the bill through and give the opportunity to some counties and use it as a pilot so we can run another bill later so we could actually get a full state adoption. Um, and that was a compromise, you know, that we just had to take. And so being being flexible and making sure you don't miss the forest for the trees. Yeah, there um, you can't always get what you want and there there are trade offs and compromises, <clears throat> excuse me, that that have to be made. Well, we're almost done in terms of time here. I wanted to thank both of our, our speakers. Thank you so much for, for joining us and 
talking about all of your very important advocacy uh, efforts and accomplishments and sharing these, these best practices with everyone. Um, today was intended to give organizations insight into what it takes to create a fertile environment for boot, food business from the policy side. Um, we're going to conclude by sharing some additional resources for um, those of you who want to look into this further. Um, the slides and the recording of this webinar will be shared with all attendees in addition to um, NALCAB's policy toolkit, um, which includes a number of um, really interesting resources, um, including templates and guidance on how to write an op-ed to your newspaper, how to reach out to your uh, representatives, how to um, request a meeting with your um, congressional representatives and senators and other policymakers. Um, so let's see. Um, additional resources that are in the uh, the slides we'll be sending are um, a link to NALCAP's policy resources and newsletters, um, a link to uh, an application for um, small business technical assistance that um, is uh, available through NALCAP's SBA Prime program. Um, we'll be uh, accepting applications through that uh, for that through April 30th on a rolling basis or until um, all funds have been expended. Um, also, we have a link to NALCAB's policy advocacy grant application for states in the Northwest. And that will be open uh, just for a couple more weeks, I believe, through um, I think it's February 26th or 28th, but you'll have to click the link to see. Um, also, um, uh, links to Cameo's local entrepreneurial ecosystem toolkit um, and links to uh, the Cook Alliance website, um, the Cook Alliance Mico County packet, um, additional resources from Cook Alliance and inclusive action for the city's website. So um, we also um, wanted to remind you to connect with us uh, via social media um, through these channels on this slide. Reach out, stay involved, stay engaged. Um, feel free to, to ask questions. Um, and um, so thank you all for, for joining our, our webinar series. Um, Please uh, check your email for the slides. Um, and uh, when you receive those, you can, you'll can you see that uh, on the final slide, you can click the link there and access all the webinar recordings and information. So uh, thank you to Cameo and to Liz Allen from Cook Alliance and from, to Lyric from uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm inclusive action for the city. Yes, inclusive action for the city. Thank you. And Storm, thank you, thank you and NALCAB um, for, um, for co-hosting. And thank you all again for everyone who is attending on this webinar um, for your active participation and those great questions. Um, like Storm said, we really appreciate your, um, your time and interest in this really important topic and very much hope that you check out all of those wonderful resources that you'll be receiving in your email and um, connect with us all um, directly for anything else that we can do to support your efforts. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Stay tuned to your email. <laughs>